Heads School of Government. I'll be introduced later. So it's my job to introduce the moderator uh, for tonight's panel. And I'm just thrilled that we have Tanya Beckett, um, well known to all of those of you who watch BBC World on television. She presents the business um, section. Tanya, what a pleasure to have you to the school for the first time. Thank you for joining us tonight and for moderating the debate. Thank you very much indeed. It is an, it's a great honour to be here. Um, I'm so impressed by the building, I can't begin to tell you uh, what a light, bright, uh, exciting place this is to be. And at, of course, a very exciting time. Who's been watching uh, the vote in the Netherlands today? Anybody? Yeah, everybody's watching that, I'm sure. Um, so tonight what I thought we would do is try to divide this hour really into three sections, and I very much want your participation in this. So we thought what we'd do is a bit of a classic structure of the where are we now, uh, meaning uh, we could talk, I think, primarily about what electorates are telling us, what they're really telling us, not what they, we would like them to be telling us or we think they're telling us, but what they're telling us because of what it is that they're experiencing. What this says about global institutions as a whole, and when we talk about global institutions, I've asked the uh, participants, the panelists, to explain what global this particular global institution, whatever it is that we refer to, actually does. Um, and... Um, you want to? He's, in. He's, got, he's in there. It's just, okay. It's just and, um, and then I would like to, um, to go on to try to work through uh, some of the solutions that we might try to put forward as to how these global institutions might dissolve or reform. Uh, so once again, welcome to all of you. Try to be provocative by using the word um, uh, dissolve there. So allow me uh, to introduce then our panellists. We have uh, Dr. Achim Steiner, uh, who's director of um, Oxford Martin School and uh, former head of the UN Environment um, Programme. So we've got an environmental perspective uh, to all of that. Welcome to you. Uh, we have here uh, Karthik Ramana, who is um, also the professor of uh, business and public policy, um, director of oh, what? The MPP. The MPP, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Difficulty with writing. And so, um, Carlos uh, Lopez here, who's the former head of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And welcome to you. So let's start off then with this initial question of the where are we question. Uh, what is it um, that electorates have been trying to say to us? Well, when we were talking um, earlier, all of us, I was saying um, that we could put it under the general heading of globalization. But globalization um, encompasses many things. Uh, two of them would be flow of trade and flow of labor. Now, of course, many economists, and I've been listening to them for years, um, would say, well, uh, free flow of trade is very important for uh, the growth of economies. Uh, and broadly, one would argue that this is true. Uh, but it's not true for every individual under that heading. Uh, that's the difficulty. So, Akim, if I can, let's, uh, let's start off with you and ask you, what do you think Broadly, um, when we see uh, votes for Brexit, for example, and for Donald Trump, and those are the only, not the only two. We're seeing it in France, the Netherlands, to some extent Germany, not uh, really Spain, but Italy, uh, many would argue, is the most dangerous one for the future of the EU. Um, what is it you think electorates are saying and why? Well, I think, first of all, people are reacting. They're reacting to uh, what I would call a perceived loss of, of choice. And I think in part also to that sense that uh, people have been deciding in the name of globalization and a broader economic rationale that this is the law of the game and you either join it or you stay out of it. And for a long time, people have seen benefits, but I think particularly with the financial crisis, which is not without precedent in history, that this triggers, you know, on the one hand, a nationalist response. It can trigger xenophobia. Uh, we are seeing at the moment a reaction against a notion of globalization that was singularly defined by economic liberalization and the primacy of trade as the driver. So my argument would be, yes, people are reacting, but let us also keep it in perspective. They're reacting in some countries, but in other parts of the world, they are not reacting that way. In fact, President Xi Jinping of China took the exact opposite direction, and so have many other developing countries, because they're actually beginning to gain a more equal role in the international trading system, and that is also part of the explanation of what we're seeing playing out right now. Can we therefore say that economies in a particular stage of their development are likely to push back in this particular way? Could we have predicted that, that the more mature economies would do that? 
Well, if he had predicted the financial crisis and had taken steps to avoid the kind of implosion that we experienced, and it's interesting that just uh, yesterday there was an interesting article saying if only the Federal Reserve Bank had read Fannie Mae and uh, the other uh, home loan institutions' annual reports six months before the financial crisis, they could have seen that they were de facto bankrupt. We have seen many failures, failures in governance, in policy, and also in economic early warning. As a result of that, the world has been thrown into a degree of turmoil, which has left people very insecure. And insecurity expresses itself in terms of your jobs, your livelihood, your income, your capacity to compete in this world where we are constantly told that nations can only succeed if they compete against each other. So part of the product of what we're seeing right now is a degree of fear and uncertainty. And I think political leadership in many countries has been woefully inadequate in addressing this. I think that I would argue that um, economists, um, often when they look back at the genesis of the uh, financial crisis, they say, well, there were many imbalances. And in fact, I was living in the US at the time, and I was very aware of these imbalances. But economists can point to imbalances, but what they don't know is at any point whether that imbalance is going to unravel naturally, the same as uh, political movements, for example, or uh, any sort of political impetus, or whether um, it will indeed turn into a crisis. So with that thought, uh, Carlos, let me turn to you and ask you what it is that you think these specific electorates are saying, and of course, balance it, if you would, by the fact that many uh, electorates in developing governments are not saying the same thing, in developing countries, economies. Well, I think uh, the electorates uh, in some countries are basically reacting to a rollback of many advantages and, and, and patterns that they were used to. A lot of it has to do with uh, the backlash on globalization, but also more deeper megatrends that people don't like to discuss, like, for instance, the demographic megatrend, the fact that the populations in most of these countries are aging yeah. and the social security system is collapsing because the number of beneficiaries is higher than the number of uh, contributors. And you have a situation where basically everything that the state has promised for a long time is no longer possible to maintain. And part of it has to do with the way we have distributed uh, wealth, uh, the financial system being protected has created, you know, uh, an insulation of a certain number of measures that were necessary in terms of economic policy. And of course, trade is just one element of it. And delocalization of uh, manufacturing has provoked, of course, a void in terms of employment in certain areas in certain regions of these countries. And we are witnessing the emergence of a different world, a world where some are losing and others are gaining. And this is something that people don't tolerate very easily, and they react. And we are seeing just politically the manifestations of a malaise. But it's a malaise that is more profound, and it's not necessarily linked to just global cooperation as a whole, but specific parts of the global cooperation that have not worked for everybody. So if we were to fix the problem of wealth inequality, would that be problem solved? Well, uh, in a great measure, uh, it will be solved in terms of, you know, making people more comfortable in terms of their aspirations being met. But I don't think it is an easy way uh, out of the crisis that we are witnessing because the crisis has a lot to do, again, with megatrends. And let's take just the technological one, you know, the fact that we are going to have a completely different world of labor, uh, the fact that, you know, technology is increasing the, the interconnectedness of a certain number of uh, dimensions uh, that are not just going to be solved by easy way out uh, addressing inequality with uh, drastic top-down measures. I think we are really witnessing the need for global cooperation to actually be reinforced, right, to respond gonna, to these challenges. We're going to come back. Uh, Karthik, Tell us, what do you think populations are saying at the moment? So let me focus in particular on the uh, situation in the United States, and then you know, some of those lessons might be generalizable and some of them might not. Um, I think in the U.S. context, um, there's certainly a, a sense of recognition that um, the returns to labor, uh, particularly if you're at anywhere less than the 95th or 96th percentile of distribution of human endowments, are stagnating. Uh, 
it's not just a question of uh, inequality in wealth, but it's also a question of uh, frustration when it comes to uh, opportunities. Uh, you know, people seek dignity in their labor, and they're unable to find opportunities that really make good on them. Uh, now, there certainly are some uh, structural reasons for this that might be uh, unconnected with the, the theme that we're discussing today, including roboticization. Uh, but uh, there are uh, structural reasons uh, that I would sort of uh, uh, broadly um, uh, characterize under the title institutional corruption. And, and by this, I would talk about, uh, or in, under this heading, I would talk about three factors. Uh, the first being... Um, uh, immigration, in particular low-skilled immigration. Uh, this is a huge issue in the United States, uh, particularly illegal low-skilled immigration. Uh, in the UK, there's been uh, an, uh, a backlash against low-skilled immigration, which is largely legal thanks to uh, freedom of movement in the EU. So uh, that's, that's one factor here. A second factor is uh, perceived inequities in uh, you know, the regulatory structure in terms of uh, tax avoidance, particularly amongst the very wealthy. Uh, and uh, the fact that there sort of seems to be a different set of rules of the game uh, for people who are uh, earning about seven figures and for everybody else. And so there's a uh, concern there. And the third really is uh, the notion that this, this elite global class have advanced a set of uh, trade rules, global trade rules, that have disadvantaged and hollowed out the American middle class, particularly the working class, uh, the, uh, the industrial communities in America. And so uh, in the American context, there is this deep anti-establishment um, uh, mood that is driven by a perception of institutional corruption. So a combination of corruption and trade policies which, which, uh, which sort of further a divide, really, and as you say, hollow out. This, we're talking here about the United States, yes. which causes disenfranchisement. Yes, and the, some of those trade policies might have uh, resulted from sort of you know, a benign understanding of uh, or misunderstanding of the adjustment costs associated with globalization. But some of them are less benign. Some of them are uh, trade policies that are advanced by global elite very much in their own interests, much like we see sort of a very different structure for uh, taxing capital gains as we do for earned income in the United States and many other parts of the world. Now, if you would explain what you think uh, we're witnessing right now. I think, you know, um, for 30 years, well, for certainly for the last 30 years, people in every part of the world have been told that globalization is good for them because it, it's a great engine of growth. And there's lots of evidence that that's true. But to quote my colleague Stefan Durkon, who's sitting at the back, who puts it beautifully simply, um, the argument that globalization creates growth tells us that the cake gets bigger. But it doesn't tell us that everybody's going to get an equally larger slice of the cake. It simply tell us, tells us that the cake gets larger, and therefore you've got to use the extra cake that you're now building to compensate the losers, because there's never been a process of globalization that doesn't produce winners and losers. And what we're seeing is a really sharp case of that, where the winners are very clear, <coughs> the losers are very clear, and what I think has happened over the last 30 years is that governments have stopped seeing it as their role to compensate the losers. They've stopped legitimating their role as being to compensate the losers. So in the 50s and 60s, a period of huge globalization, governments made great efforts to find ways to compensate those who weren't winning from globalization, you know, through the health service, through education provision, and all of these things. That stopped, in my view, around the 80s, and governments started seeing that as less and less and started relying on the simple proposition that growth was good for everybody. And that's what people are responding to. I think it's three things we're hearing from the electorate. One is we're economically precarious and we're worried. It's not necessarily, it's not the poorest who are revolting against the establishment. It's the, as one author puts it, it's the elite of the left behind. It's those who were expecting a good life, were expecting their children to have an even better life and suddenly realize that that's not true and worse, that other people seem to be overtaking them. And that other people overtaking them is a very important social effect. And that's making them feel culturally at risk, that their culture might be overtaken. If they're being overtaken economically, what next, culturally? And socially, that they're losing status. And I think those three effects are leading people 
to revolt against the establishment. Five years ago, it would have been acceptable to give the answer, for example, to um, people who lost their jobs in the car industry, for example, in the United States, to say, well, economics rules. And if the economics are that this is cheaper to do in Mexico or if it's cheaper to produce in China, that is better for the consumer. The consumer wins and the consumer is also you. So tough luck. You need to move on. And what we're saying is that that, that answer is no longer acceptable. I remember sitting in a, a G20 planning meeting, I guess, just after the crisis. And one of the officials there said, well, look, what we need to do is to assure people that we're going to manage globalization better. We're going to manage it so it's more inclusive and brings benefits to all. And, you know, my reaction was, well, that's fine, except that every single G20 and G7 meeting has been saying exactly that for 20 years. And the public aren't stupid. They've heard this a lot. And what they're not seeing is that it is being managed differently in a way that makes their lives feel less precarious. Okay, we're going to come back uh, very shortly, I think, to, um, to what it is that we can do and how, uh, what, where the solutions are. Does anybody have any thoughts, just as we reach the end of what the problem is kind of section, as to what anybody else thinks is being said by electorates? They're quite out. Yes. Either you're going to have to... Oh, there we go. A microphone is heading your way very fast. If you'd um, tell us your name and where you're from, and just uh, a quick question, that would be great. <coughs> um, <coughs> my name is not important. I come from Uganda. Welcome. I have one question for the panelists. Um, do you believe in something called the empire and phenomenon called imperialism? Right. Well, I suppose the first thing is, that, well, what is the purpose of the question? Do you believe in empire and imperialism? Meaning, should it exist or has it existed? Does it exist? Does it exist now? Empires and imperialism, does it exist now? Anybody want to take that one? I think it's for you, Carlos. I suppose you mean in, econo <laughs> I suppose you mean in economic terms rather than political. No, no, no. In any term. No, no. Imperialism is a multifaceted right. phenomenon, yeah. political, economic, cultural geopolitical. Globalization equals imperialism, I think. Okay. Well, Globalization equals imperialism, just in case anybody didn't hear that. Well, I, I think uh, uh, implicit in that question is the notion that we are basically attaining a certain peak of distribution of power that was led by the United States. And right now, we are seeing the emergence of China as a new player that probably is going to be placing itself, at least it has the, the will, as the leader of a number of uh, uh, global uh, constructs. And I, I think this is the beginning of the empire dismantling, if we can put it in that way, uh, in the sense that normally countries' history uh, is marked by moments where they may be at the helm, but there are also moments where they retreat. And there is a sense of crisis right now in the United States, and maybe that's the demonstration that something is terribly wrong, and their role is no longer going to be probably what they thought it was going to be forever. So there is an hesitation, and that hesitation is a manifestation of a a big shift, a tectonic shift in the world. Any other thoughts from the audience before we move on? Okay, so, oh yes please, yes please. Um, microphone. Microphone on its way to you. That's Potts, re retired economist. Um, could you comment on the China effect? on the U.S. Uh, labor market. Some recent research seems to suggest that the effect is enormous. Um, people like Joe Stiglitz have mentioned this. So the effect that the U.S., uh, that China, the growth, the economic growth the of effect, China, outsourcing of manufacturing yes, the effect, and so the effect on, on incomes, on, uh, on, the US on, on jobs, um, and so on. What do you, is it, you're a retired economist, but what do you think it is, just very briefly? Uh, I find it very plausible that, that it's had a very significant effect um, yeah. because it, it's been so huge. The, um, yeah. Anybody, the very quickly, any thoughts on that? Well, my only caveat 
on um, the argument about saving jobs is that I think you're really just saving work for robots. I think you've got, it's not just about jobs anymore. When, when you persuade an American car manufacturer not to um, build cars in Mexico, it seems to me that you're not creating jobs for Americans, you're creating jobs for American robots. And, and a lot of industry, I think that's true of. It might not be immediate, but certainly if we look over the next 10 years, that will be the case. Right, okay, so let's move on now to talk about institutions. We have many of them, um, and they were designed, were they not, to try to correct some of these imbalances. The International Monetary Fund is there to try to uh, save countries and impose uh, from economic collapse, and um, doesn't always work, does it? But uh, it's still struggling with Greece, for example. Um, we have the World Trade Organization, um, which is seen largely to... Uh, correct trade disputes, a bit slow on that front, often criticised as being so. Uh, we've got the UN, uh, which is criticised as being unwieldy. We've got the EU, which is criticised as being unwieldy. And then we've got the Euro, of course, managed by the European Central Bank, um, which uh, doesn't allow what's called fiscal transfer, meaning it imposes a currency on uh, it, the nations that join, but it doesn't allow or force <coughs> nations to step in and save nations which are struggling because the currency is too strong for their economy. So are all of these institutions failing us? We've got NAFTA as a trade deal, of course. Um, we're seeing uh, struggles with TTIP and so on. Uh, and, of course, there's these big questions about NATO introduced by Donald Trump about who pays and whether they pay enough. Does anybody want to talk to me? Let's start, let's start if we can, uh, with you, Achim, uh, uh, about where these institutions might be going wrong. Were they not supposed to save us from precisely the situation we're in at the moment? No, I think that is the wrong way of posing the question, if I may, with all due respect, Henry, because I actually think, first of all, the Bretton Woods institutions are not the same as the United Nations. The Bretton Woods institutions were born out of a different process. Yeah. I think it's very important part of our debate this evening should be about whether the principle of every nation having a voice and representation in the UN General Assembly is something different than having a coalition of the willing or a group of countries getting together, such as the G20, and deciding what is good for the rest of the world. I agree with Neri. I think G20 has not proven itself as a more effective way of helping the world deal with these crises. Here we are, many years later, and what was seen as a kind of counter model to uh, multilateralism is actually a club of self-interested countries getting together, and if they do well, they may stabilize some of the things for which they actually have the greatest responsibility as the dominant economies in the, in, in the world. The UN is something different, and um, part of uh, the reason, I think, for our discussion this evening is to ask ourselves whether a body in which every nation is represented and has a voice confers, first of all, legitimacy. Secondly, it gives us authority to intervene on behalf of the peoples of this world. And with it comes also my challenge to this notion that somehow the United Nations is a failure. I think there are many failings in the United Nations, and it begins with the fact that it was born out of a world that was failing. It is, in many ways, the antithesis of a world not united, and therefore, by definition, as long as governments fail us, as long as governance fails us in our societies, the United Nations is actually very often the last recourse that people have. And therefore, to those who enter a debate like this and would argue our international system is failing us, let me first of all say I can critique a great deal about globalization. Globalization is not the same as multilateralism. The principle of global cooperation with equal rights at the table is also different from sitting in a green room in the World Trade Organization and essentially negotiating a deal. Now, let us also acknowledge that we lose perspective in the frustration about what's happening in our own communities and countries, and it is always easy to blame, and unfortunately politicians reinforce that time and again in every country, that you blame something that is somehow outside your country. It's the European Commission, it's the United Nations, it's the IMF, um, it's China, or it's the United States. I think one of the things that is extremely important in a debate about global cooperation is, first of all, to say there are issues for which there is no solution unless every country is brought to the table. And there is no better principle than having the right to be represented, whether you're a small nation or a large nation, in that room. You may not be able to exert your influence, and imperfection will dominate because coalitions will build inside a multilateral system. 
But let us also acknowledge that as you leave here this evening, there are millions of people who will be alive this evening because the world came together and formed the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Food Program, UNICEF, and I could go on. And there are literally tens of millions of people who will be alive tomorrow because that commitment was made. Secondly, let's also talk about this issue of perceived failure in terms of efficiency. You know that people in the UK spend almost the same amount on keeping their pets fed and well looked after, which is a perfectly understandable thing, as the entire world is willing to spend on the total peacekeeping efforts around the world. And I could read out the list of 15 countries and conflicts in which 100,000 peacekeepers are at this very moment risking their lives, living in extremely difficult conditions, being paid not a lot in order to avoid the kind of scenario that led to the moment in 1945 when the United Nations was formed. So two things, simply in response to what you say. <clears throat> Let's not conflate the problems of globalization, which, as I said at the beginning, I think was far too narrowly defined by trade liberalization. And in fact, the UN, interesting enough, in 2015, in my mind, provided the other half to this agenda, which is Agenda 2030, in which equity and sustainability are elevated alongside this economic paradigm. And just a small remark, if you allow me, there is no reason to apologize for the United Nations having challenges in a world full of challenges. What I, however, do not wish to be understood for is that there are also many self-inflicted failures within the system of organizations as they function. But are they really so fundamentally different from our local council, from our parliaments, from our elected officials? And I think people are given a story that takes totally out of perspective and out of proportion some of the weaknesses and forgets to tell the story of a United Nations system working 24-7, 365 days a year for the world and a vision of a better world than what we actually had when we set it up in 1945. Fine. Well, let's come back to the UN, but also pick up on the, the, the point that you made right at the start there, is that there are a mixture of organizations. Some of them have a lot of countries involved, and the UN would be a good example of that. We also have the G7 and the G20, uh, which are the richest nations in the world, the 20 and the 7, of course. And as you rightly say, they get together and have discussions about global economic policy. But now, if, if we can actually, let, let's come to you first and say, what role might a small institution have, a smaller institution have, where there are only few countries involved? What sort of uh, role might it play? And what role might a larger group of countries play? And is is there a role for those larger groups? Yeah, so uh, absolutely there is a role for the UN but, and, and large multilateral organizations, uh, very much along the lines of uh, some of the uh, uh, aspects that, that Achim has highlighted. Um, but I think currently the, the paradigm of multilateralism is, is extended well beyond its, its usefulness. So uh, consider an issue like climate change. You know, Akim said, well, there are certain problems in the world that require all of the players in the world to come together to resolve. Now, oftentimes, people think of climate change as one such problem. Yeah. And I would suggest that actually you're far more likely to get some sort of sensible movement on issues of uh, emission if you have the two big players in the world, China and the United States, sit down together and say, what are some things we can mutually agree on in terms of our emission standards, in terms of what we're willing to allow our producers to get away with? And, and you know, in the process, they will be able to forge some standard that the rest of the world can decide to opt in on or improve upon. The, the, they may not yeah. choose to do that because they might say, well, it gives us an economic disadvantage if we impose those standards on our companies. So, at the end of the day, what has to drive the, 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 these kinds of decisions is the will of the people in these, organ in, in these countries. And so when you think about an issue like climate change, you know, when, when it comes to bite in, in terms of the standard of living, when it comes to bite in terms of the quality of life, that's when you see governments really responding in a way that will align the interests of uh, 
sort of you know, the global uh, perspective with that of what these countries are willing to 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 uh, to, to, to stand for or tolerate. So if uh, people in North Dakota are particularly keen on economic opportunities because they haven't seen many in uh, several years, uh, then uh, you know they should be able to vote on this issue as they have uh, to have a pipeline run through. Um, Similarly in China, when the pollution standards in Beijing reach a, a level where it's uh, unsustainable for the quality of life that the people are willing to tolerate, then we will see the government there really take this issue seriously. And I would submit that there is a certain um, uh, under, uh, underappreciation of the management challenges associated with having these large multilateral uh, organizations trying to forge uh, consensus across uh, these very complex issues. Once you get past three or four countries, maybe at the very end of it, top of the spectrum, five countries, it becomes really hard to manage the competing interests. And so there is a sort of efficiency argument you can make, which is quite compelling in that it will get us much further than the current multilateral system would. Nari, would you agree with that, this, this, this role really, perhaps we need to work in smaller groups? So I think... There is, there is the crisis management role. So my challenge to Akeem would be, in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis, if you'd tried to find a global solution to stop the world economy seizing up by using the United Nations, you would have been in great, great trouble. The world economy would have crashed before you'd got a decision. So in that situation, calling the G8 leaders, the G20 leaders, to Washington, which is what President Bush did, and having an agreement immediately from all of those 20 countries, the 20 largest economies, that they would take measures to try to sustain growth, I think was very important. It was an important signal to other countries, but it was also important because that informal group was agile. That said, there are real limits to that agility. So when the, it didn't used to be the G20, it used to be the G7. And after the East Asian financial crisis in 1997, when the G7 got together to decide to deal with that crisis, they very quickly realized that they couldn't. It was a delusion that they, the most powerful seven economies, could tell the emerging markets what to do. And because they realized they couldn't do that, they had to expand the group to the G20. And so there is, there is this balance between agility and inclusion. But then the, the last thing I'd say is that these ad hoc, there's always this temptation in decision making to make it with the smallest possible group. You know, the easiest decision is a group of one because you don't disagree with yourself, right? Okay. Or two, or the two most powerful, or the three most powerful. And that temptation has to be balanced against the fact that it's very unlikely that one or two countries are going to be able to implement a deal. So China and the United States might come to some agreement between the two of them, but if you look at their supply chains, production, markets and everything else, you can't actually solve climate change with just the two of them. And it's both the interdependence and it's also because, frankly, you're going to need other partners to link the issues and to shame the big partners into taking more action. So that, there's a, so that last point is that there's a reason why, in the end, we need the international organizations. And that's you can get a small group to make a decision. But when it actually comes to implementing it, you're going to need an international organization, even though they're slow and cumbersome and take forever to make decisions and to report back on them. There's a very good democratic reason for that. And that's it, as each of you perhaps have had the, the privilege of electing a government in your country, some of you not, some of you have. You didn't go to the trouble of voting a government or participating in democracy in order for that government to go to an to, to say, oh, actually, I'm just going to leave it to the United States to make all the decisions because they can steward globalization. Or I'm just going to leave it to the United Nations to make decisions. You've voted them to go and represent your interests. And that means there's 192 countries there, and they're all ethically bound to, to protect their national interests. And that makes it very difficult to get agreement. But that's why you can have the G7 or the G20 make a quick decision you then need organizations like the World Trade Organization or the UN or the IMF to actually go away, draw up rules, undertake the painful, painstaking business of actually translating that decision into real actions, policies, outcomes on the ground.
Carlos, there is uh, what, what is often referred to as the democratic deficit, meaning uh, exactly what Nara has referred to here, is that uh, you get a creep sometimes of decision making uh, and there's compromise. And this is a little bit, I think, what Donald Trump has been referring to is I don't want to get involved in multilateral trade deals. I want to make it deal at a time. So what, what is your view on these large institutions and their role versus the small ones? I would challenge the view from Kartik. You know, starting with the example that you, you picked, uh, climate change. <coughs> who defines what emissions are? Who, who gets into the standardization of concepts, interpretation that is accepted by everybody? It's a body that is multilateral that does that. And when, when it does that is through the UN, like the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. So you have the scientific knowledge that has been put together by something that is constructed through a multilateral process. And if you accept that first premise as already to be multilateral, why few countries are going to be deciding for the rest of the world, even though they are the biggest emitters? Let's uh, take the example of China, for instance. China uh, is in a process of uh, accelerated growth. Its growth is, in large measure, the result of processing minerals that come from other parts of the world. And, you know, a continent like Africa may not be very important for the discussion about emissions, but is the number one continent in terms of suffering from those emissions. So, should it be part of the discussion or not? It's the one that's suffering the most, but it's going to be excluded because it's not emitting. So you see, there are always interests that are interconnected that may not be represented by the interests of those who are the most powerful, that may be, for efficiency purposes, the ones that you, you would pick, because there are collateral elements that have to be bear, uh, take, taken into consideration. And I will go even further. I will say, if you take the example of climate change, you may get an agreement that is not very, uh, say, implementable, not very efficient. But sometimes we forget that these agreements are also to consolidate a certain number of positions for the public opinion to adopt principles that before were not part of the discussion. Very often, when you have an agreement of that type of proportion in the international system, you are actually not closing the debate about the themes that have been introduced in that document, but rather opening the debate about the same. And that will allow for coalitions of the willing to actually proliferate as a result of opening that new front of the debate. You may say, for instance, the uh, discussion about taxation was not part of the financing for development process of the UN. Then it was introduced for the first time in Addis Ababa last, uh, last year, or uh, two, two years ago. And what was the effect of that? Was uh, a perception by civil society organizations, by NGOs, by activists, that what was in the text was absolutely inadequate and absolutely uh, dispensable because it was not really tackling the real issues. But what one forgets is that this issue was not part of the agenda at all. It has entered the discussion for the first time in that document. And now it's going to be tackled in a different way. Before, it was done by a few countries and by a few institutions, but not Could you probably explain the tax issue, tax issue you're talking about? Well, it's basically, you know, for the first time the UN has been asked to include in a document something related to regulation of taxation yeah. at international level. And this was before, you know, handled by other organizations with smaller composition and by a few countries leading the way. So I think you, you have the issue of legitimacy that has to come into so the you're debate. sort of talking about a model, really, whereby you have an international standard. A group of uh, countries get together, the coalition of the willing, as you're describing them, and also almost want to set an international standard and say, we have decided we are setting this, and you, uh, other countries then can be part of it. Is that, is that a, a reasonable way to start? If I can just, uh, you know, give two quick illustrations uh, to, to get it a bit more grounded into what people will understand, you know, uh, between China and the United States, you have the majority of flights, you know, in the world. But who defines the corridors? 
that you are going to use for air traffic? These two countries? No, it's the UN. Uh, if, you, if you take uh, the consumption patterns on pharma between the United States and China, you will say these two countries are the biggest consumers of pharma. Are they going to decide the standards? No, it's the WHO. Why? There are very good reasons for it. So let me just make two points on this. One, I think that, um, uh, I, and here I'll reveal my bias to action over deliberation. So while, yes, there is absolutely some merit to having a deliberative process that might bring some uh, issues that would otherwise not be on the agenda there, I think particularly when you look at an issue like climate change, uh, it's important to get something done. And in that spirit, having a few countries particularly impactful countries moving the position forward uh, is probably better than having a, a, an unwieldy multilateral process that makes uh, little to no progress. I think uh, another example of a situation where uh, a unilateral or perhaps a bilateral approach has been reasonably successful is uh, in combating multinational corporate corruption. So here's a, a situation where the U.S. passed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which was sort of unilateral and almost unprecedented at, at the time because the European Union or the countries that now constitute the European Union didn't have such rules, didn't have such practices. But the reach of American commerce is such, and America took the moral imperative in that moment and said this kind of corrupting influence of business ought to be constricted, ought, ought to be constrained. And that had a profound impact in changing multinational business practices because if they were to have any kind of uh, connection with the United States, they would fall within the jurisdiction of the United States on this particular issue. And then when Britain passed its uh, Anti-Bribery Act, it had sort of a similar impact. And in fact, uh, Britain has described its uh, jurisdiction, uh, or the jurisdiction of its Bribery Act, uh, as even more far-reaching than the American one. But of course, the scale of British commerce is, is, is smaller than that of, of America's. So, but here are examples of two countries that unilaterally or bilaterally advanced a global public purpose uh, in the face of, you know, and the Germans were actually very late to the table in sort of adopting standards around uh, uh, sort of corruption, uh, multinational corporate corruption. Yeah. yeah. May I, I mean, <clears throat> you know, part of the debate is the idea that we also tease out things at the, let's say, at the caricature extreme level. So I have to fundamentally challenge Karthik on the climate change story. The very reason why the world is so late in addressing climate change is precisely because the G2 spent 10 years for different reasons. And you may argue as a US citizen, it was legitimate, or as a Chinese citizen, it was legitimate, stopping the rest of the world actually from advancing meaningful action on climate change. And it was only because the international community through the UN over 20 years, which seems extraordinarily long when you were the head of the UN Environment Program at the time, but is actually in historical terms just a moment to achieve something absolutely extraordinary. We have just agreed in Paris the end of the fossil fuel age, which is essentially mortgaging the future of this planet because of 300 years of enjoying for a few generations the privilege, or one could say increasingly the perverse luxury, of being able to drive for just you know, 50 cents or 30 cents a liter of petrol, or one pound, one pound 50. I mean, the, the range of prices in the world is extraordinary. And it was the United Nations that year after year, first of all, helped the world disentangle from national interest the science, because remember, there were administrations in different countries around the world that were stopping science from being published, and we are maybe even heading back to that age again. Secondly, it also brought the world's nations every year through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and I was referring to the IPCC beforehand on the science side, every year together in the full glaring light of the public watching and actually judging their efforts to work <coughs> on a solution to climate change as inadequate. And it was in Copenhagen where the US and China, I would say, were actually the principal stumbling blocks to reaching an agreement. And yet the world in 2015 finally managed to do it because also in the US, self-interest began to signal to government that something had to be done. Secondly, selecting something like corruption, rather, um, US exceptionalism, but also other countries play a similar game is far too messy to pick out an issue like corruption to say here the moral imperative of one country, be it the US now, the United Kingdom, or um, you know, France, or India for that matter, 
is an example that leadership works. Yes, countries have unfortunately picked issues whenever it suited them mm. and put others under the carpet because it didn't suit them. And part of what we're living through right now mm. is that, yes, globalization, which for 20 years was argued by the OECD countries as being the only way to go, and did yield, as Nairi said, a lot of poverty reduction, a lot more economic opportunity. But what wasn't part of the narrative at the time is, yes, if you want the rules of the game to change and to, to apply to everyone, it gets tough when the others get as good as you are. And that's when, you know, factories start moving, jobs start migrating. Now the question is, is this a temporary phenomenon? And how do we make it work in a way? And I think this is where singularizing the globalization then to trade through the WTO is in retrospect, I think, one of the explanations why we are now falling apart over the concept of globalization, because we did not recognize that some fundamental transitions were going to be part of this shifting uh, global economy. Or were we just looking really at the problem as, as a macro problem rather than... Rather than That's a big problem. part of it, because yeah. I think, you know, economists and um, national statisticians and all the statistics you read about poverty um, are a very difficult story, because... If you actually look at the United States in 2017, its unemployment rate isn't exactly in a disastrous situation. No, it isn't. Um, it's 5%. You know, a number of countries who have embraced renewable energy technology to change the national energy systems are amongst the most successful economies yes. in the world. So there the issue is, is not that it, it is, as I think you were talking about. It's, 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 it seems to be one of social change. Um, which is primarily the issue. So does anybody have any thoughts quickly? Because I've got to get on the third part of the break. Yes, the gentleman with the yellow pen over there. Hi, I wanted to ask, um, Joseph Stiglitz argued in the late 90s that Bretton Woods... Nobel what Prize winning economist, Joseph Stiglitz. That's right. Yep. Uh, that the Bretton Woods institutions, at least two of them, the IMF and the World Bank, are kind of reversed their mandate. I wanted to know if this was... agreed with this mm -hmm. and whether you thought mm -hmm. it was... Uh, in what way have they reversed their mandate? Well, they'd, they were there to solve problems of distribution, effectively, around the world, and instead have started to impose uh, conditionalities and uh, a governance framework that was working to the advantage of uh, the more developed economies. And I wanted to know if this was an example of this institutional corruption and whether we can oh, okay. characterise right. that as just elite capture within right. these institutions. Okay, so the IMF and the World Bank were set up for one purpose, but in fact have started to impose rather than solve problems. Yeah, so I think Stiglitz's argument is that, is that after the horrible experience of the Great Depression and then obviously the Second World War, the IMF is created to actually create a system of controlled capital. You couldn't take money from one country to another under the initial IMF system. And, that was the, and the idea was that if you wanted to liberalise trade, you needed to keep control of money. In other words, you needed to leave governments in control of some of the levers of their economy if you wanted to start getting global trade working. And that system broke down in the 1970s, 69 and 71, when the United States decided to come out of that system and to basically unleash, a, a, you know, to deregulate the use of the dollar around the world, to unleash the capital markets that we're now used to, where money, trillions of dollars, simply moves around the world and makes it more difficult for governments to make decisions, more difficult for governments to do things, as I was talking about before, like compensating the losers. Okay, any other? Yes, please. Yes, these two, please. And then we'll move on to the next section. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah Mark Robinson from London University. Um, I just want to take us back to the title tonight, which is this end of global cooperation question. I mean, I certainly think it's the end of global cooperation as it is currently being exercised right. because it isn't working in a lot of areas. Um, just taking up Akim's point, I, I have friends who work at UNDP and I agree with you, you know, they do fantastic work, heroics every day trying to deliver the mission. But that mission has morphed so much from the original ideas that Bretton Woods set out. The UN is involved in so many areas. The IEA is doing research on many, many topics, nothing to do with nuclear proliferation. Um, so my point really is the governance of this entity that's morphed into the UN today is very difficult. And you talked about 
agreements being reached in Paris recently, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many of them are actually delivered. Kyoto made many agreements, yeah. many of which were not met because the UN dragged the nations through some of those decisions. So the power still rests in those nation states and have a lot of our governing um, bodies of these world bodies forgotten that. So uh, mission creep. Mission creep and poor governance because not accepting the Trump idea that the power rests with the nations. Right. I think we've sort of addressed some of that, haven't we? But does anybody want to talk about, just briefly, about mission creep? I mean, it seems more of a statement than the, a the, the one thing I would say about mission creep is that 50 years ago, the UNDP was funded by governments giving it budget. 96% of its budget today is the UNDP running around with a begging bowl, getting money for special projects. And that's the same of pretty much all international organizations. They've all become, to some degree, organizations for hire. And that means their role has had to change, and they ha have had to start doing all kinds of things for different donors. And this is where the point about management comes in. Bureaucracies assume a life of their own, and then they you know, look for new reasons for them to exist and, <laughs> and grow. And so I think you know, the closer government is to the people that, is be, that, it, it, that it serves, the more likely government can be reined in. So. Right. I would like to take just uh, one more question, at least here, please. And this gentleman at the back. Uh, yeah. Joanna Foster, I wondered what your view was or your hopes were about the forthcoming talks between China and America, Trump and Ping, and what might possibly come out of that. Which At a Trump hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, why not? Go for it. Well, I think anybody who, at the moment... So I just might add a bit of background there, that uh, mm. Donald Trump has uh, been very critical of China's role in the global economy and has accused China of manipulating its currency in order to gain trade advantage. Um, and um, this, there was the small issue of Taiwan as well. Um, but putting that aside, um, they, the two leaders are now going to get together and it'll be very interesting to see what is going to be said. I think the relationship between China and the US is going to be recalibrated. Now, in each country, the leadership would like to obviously demonstrate <clears throat> that it is they who are in charge of this recalibration. So, uh, you know, an emerging China uh, clearly having changed its tenor in terms of playing a global leadership role, therefore also engaging far more actively in, in many international processes, including through the multilateral system. A U.S. administration that, you know, puts a lot of uh, economic blame for the problems that it wishes to tackle on China I think set a fairly difficult departure point for this. And I would again argue if the world um, essentially premises its own interests on a bilateral dynamic simply defined by these two mega economies, it will be the loser for it. And that is why it is extremely important that these two nations talk, that they find a way in which to reconcile what are you know, realities and domestic political agendas, but at the same time, it has to be embedded in an understanding that this cannot be a kind of, you know, G2 world in which two countries decide <coughs> for the rest of the world how the system will run. And that's what the G20 also is, I think, sometimes also experiencing mission creep because it saw itself as an emergency response, quite rightly, as you said, Mary, to the financial crisis. But then it began to morph into, well, if we could decide in the G20 how to do things, then the rest of the world will come along. And here, I just have to say to you, beware of a form of economic Darwinism in the 21st century, where 20 countries that may account for 70, 75% of the global economy take it upon themselves to define the rules of the game. I think this comes back to Carthage's point that everybody wants to keep making themselves relevant. And <laughs> there but, is it's, that but it's also, I think, a sign that the world has changed fast. China has become hugely more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the United States. That's difficult for a hegemonic power to come to grips with. Mm. If you think back to Greece, <clears throat> Rome, you know, the Pax Britannica, it took Britain a long time. Some would say that there are some people in Whitehall or Westminster that still haven't quite adjusted <laughs> to the fact that the empire is not there. And I, I, think, I think that that, no, but that time, I, I mean that very seriously. Um, 
The U.S. and China are very interdependent. China, for its growth, depended on the United States market. The United States, for its profligate spending, has depended upon China to buy its T-bills and put money into the U.S. Treasury. And that relationship is a tight and interdependent one. But what's changed in the last 10 years is that China has hugely diversified its, the sources of its raw materials, its markets, its market access around the rest of the world. There is a world of China and the rest of the world. And so I think the United States is not in the same strong position as it was. And when the gentleman who asked about imperialism asked that, my first thought was that all the various historians who are writing about this presidential administration in the United States being a classic case of the last throes of the imperial power with all the excesses and, and vanities, in a way, of that. Right. Let's just take this question from the back. Yes, please, sir. So my name is Jacob. I'm the MSc for Global Governance and Diplomacy. Um, my question revolves around um, kind of representative legitimacy and also the state-centric nature of the discussion so far. So is part of the problem in these institutions right now, regardless of whether they work or not work, um, the sense of whether it's representat representativeness, um, being able to see what's going on, not having these green rooms and closed doors that might be working um, in favor of population, but also might not be. Um, how do you improve that, that visibility and ownership? And I think part of that ties to the very kind of state-centric nature of our discussion so far, and that we've talked about, okay, do you want a small group of nations or a big group of nations, but are nations representing people enough? So if we look at the, the COP model, um, we had NGOs, indigenous people's organizations, the private sector, looking at representation and complicating the notion of how people have their voices heard and have a sense of ownership, which is ultimately why I think I oppose Professor um, Romano's point about you know, action deliberation in small groups, because when you have these small groups of nations, um, whether they're powerful or not, there is A, the, the risk of a blunt instrument, um, not having enough minds in the room, having solutions that don't work, but also when you have a crisis, you want to have a crisis response, but you also want to have crisis learning, right? And to have learning, you need to have a buy-in and ownership of... Okay, so I think you're using this word ownership, and I think what you're saying is that um, people need to be connected to the populations and understand the populations they're affecting broadly, right? And essentially need to see themselves in the solution and see themselves as part of the solution, not just this group of international elites that might be representative across geography, but vertically aren't representative. So... Yes. Well, if I can Carlos. just use an extreme example, which is the way banking regulation in the United States is starting to globalize. You know, how they punish any banks that don't follow their rules and how this is a way of consolidating the banking sector of the United States against the interests of competing banks, including from Western countries. And, you know, if uh, uh, Aribap Bank uh, decides to do business with Sudan, it's punished by the regulators in the U.S., and he has to pay $1 billion fine, uh, and so on and so forth. You have right now a situation where a number of African embassies in Washington and New York, I think the number is close to 30, cannot even have a bank account because according to the U.S. banking regulators, they have to fulfill so many conditions uh, because their countries are under a, a, and that's thre often a threat been, list. Right, so th this has often been interpreted in the United States saying, we have these political issues with these countries and we are going to tell you how you do business based on our political Exactly, benefits. so but this, is, this right. is an extreme demonstration that your self-interest can be imposed if you have power. Right. And y you impose it in a way uh, that, you know, you can claim for, the, for your public opinion that it is for their interests. We are protecting the interests and security of the United States. But in fact, it furthers your political agenda. And your interests. Right. But also, to the, young, um, to the gentleman's point, um, I think what you rightly say is you can't just assume that liberal democracies will cooperate well. What we're seeing at the moment is actually it's democracies who are, who are opposed to global cooperation, global institutions. And, you know, you know, to watch President Trump's denunciation of international cooperation and President Xi Jinping's embrace of it 
this year has been a stark reminder of that. And I think your point is a very important one, which is to remind us all that democracies have to bring their own people, their own interest groups, their own advocacy groups, their own NGOs, their own firms to that global cooperation table. In other words, they've got to, they've got to be representative right to that degree. So, and I think Britain, in a way, lost the connection of many Brits, older Brits, by not engaging them enough in what the relationship with the European Union was. Was there a question? Which Achim was saying there was a question from here. Is that what you said? No, I just wanted to respond. To oh, one I beg your pardon. Sorry. <clears throat> you, may yes, of I course, have your you may. <clears throat> Governance. Um, I just want to echo what you have said. Many agencies, like all entities, if they are not governed actively, and also if the interests of the governors are not aligned, can have mission creep, can lose their focus. And certainly, I think UNDP is a program that was born out of a particular era, is today operating in another era, and I think is in serious need of redefining its role, which is actually being attempted. But let me just make one plea. The failure in governance should not be equated with a failure in the rationale of having a multilateral system. What the UN is suffering from, I would say, for the better part of two decades now, is actually benign neglect in the national interest. And this is tragic, because countries have felt that they have more to gain from letting a kind of vacuum play out in New York post-Cold War. And whether this is in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, because maybe we can find some minerals somewhere in, in, in the deep seas, and you know we'd rather not have any regulation, or whether it is other issues, I think it is high time that the world actually took the United Nations seriously again. Because if it doesn't govern it, and govern it on principles on which it was founded, the world will lose just about the only hope we have for being able to deal in a way that can unite the world rather than divide it into blocks and groups and interest groups for things that are just unmanageable without this forum. And so. The UN has many faults. It was born out of a world that went wrong, and it is trying to help a world that is constantly doing things wrong. But please, and that was part of the stimulation for the debate tonight, don't let yourself be led down a direction where you abandon. And I would urge you, take a look at the charter, because the United Nations is actually the charter with which it was founded. And we can certainly find a way to rediscover the principles of this charter to govern it. But do not trade in this extraordinary gift that the post-war generation gave us in the name of efficiency through having a few decide for the many what the rules of the game are. This would be a tragic recipe in the 21st century. And remember also, there are continents such as Africa, and we have talked a lot about this in the last few weeks here in Oxford, that, you know, just 60, 70 years from now, we'll have more people living on the African continent than the world had in 1950. And if this group of nations has to enter the game constantly being disadvantaged by being a late arrival or not being part of the G20, where do you think the world will end up? Okay. That's my plan. I think that takes us very neatly into the last section. I'm going to take some comments in a second. Um, but we've now morphed into, and we're, I'm worried about getting mission creep as well, but what we, <laughs> what we <laughs> happens in all our lives, doesn't it? But, um, but I think that's what, what, what you have started to say there, is we have to be careful that we do not get rid of large institutions, and the UN is a good one, because we would lose a sort of democratic influence and everybody's interest would not be represented. So can we then move on to the final part of what I wanted to get to, which is where do we see solutions here? How, if at all, and which institutions need some sort of refocusing and reform? So let me say that I'm generally a big fan of competition particularly competition for ideas. And what about a competition between institutions? It, precisely. <laughs> and so I think, particularly if you accept Nairi's thesis that the United States is uh, in decline, which I vehemently disagree with, but if you accept that <laughs> thesis, um, then uh, you, should, you shouldn't be concerned about the United States uh, setting global standards because other players will emerge to compete with the United States standards and we might in fact end up with you know a, a better outcome for that. So the idea, the notion that you would be able to put together 192 uh, member states together to design some set of rules of the game for the whole world, I think that you know while that sounds wonderful on paper 
the track record suggests that it's, it's uh, you know, sort of less than plausible. So uh, having a system where countries vigorously advance their interests, uh, just like in the market process, uh, having company, uh, having, just as companies vigorously compete with each other, having countries vigorously compete with each other, recognizing that there are certain limits to uh, that, that competition in this uh, spirit of world peace, um, would actually help us advance many of these global issues. Okay. I'm conscious I'm trying to wrap up here, Nari. Yeah. So, that said, um, the countries that can least afford to do a kind of deal-by-deal -deal diplomacy are democracies. Why? Because the leadership of democracies changes every time they have an election. And if every leader simply does deals, if President Trump sees fit to repudiate deals that American governments have made, visas, trade deals, whatever they are, and just to ignore them, no country has any reason to believe that an agreement that he makes will be upheld by any subsequent government. And countries aren't that interested in a four-year deal. They're interested in a long-term deal. They're interested in a very simple notion, pacta sunt savanda. You write that a country, the state, takes on the obligations, whichever government is in power. And that's quite a powerful one. So it's one constraint on the deal by deal. Um, that said, where I, where I think Kartik and I agree is that I think that certain kinds of competition, particularly among economic institutions, are really good, particularly for small countries. I think that the emergence, for example, of different Asian um, regional arrangements is the only thing that has pushed both the IMF and the World Bank to reform themselves. After decades of developing countries saying, please give us more voice, it was when first Japan and then China said, OK, if you're not going to give us more voice along with those other countries, we'll build our own institutions. And then suddenly Washington moved. So I think competition can play a useful role. Where do I see global cooperation coming, going? I, think, I don't think the United States is in decline in all ways. I think that it has ch what's changed is the United States' ability unilaterally to order other countries to do things and to pull the levers of power. I think that it was, it's always been overstated by, by everybody, both within and outside the United States, but I think it's particularly weaker now that we, we, we see a world differently configured. And one of the reasons for that is that where I see global cooperation having gotten to is that countries, particularly since 2008, have started building many more lines of defense at the national level, at the regional level, at the larger regional level, and then at the global level. And maybe I'm seeing this too much in terms of global finance, um, how they deal with financial crises, but I see a world where actually, if we look at countries on the continent of Africa, Latin America, across Asia, um, countries are actually in a more resilient position in some ways because they have more arrangements to rely upon. It's not just the one arrangements that sit in Washington, D.C. Carlos, let me come to you. Yes, the, the history of competition is, is an history of where you basically look into the static moment and those who are in power benefited from conditions that they don't want others to accede. You know, if you have benefited from an intellectual property regime, you don't want others to benefit from it because that will put you in a situation that will no longer allow you to keep control. Uh, so I'm, I'm dead against the idea that competition is transparent on its own. Competition as a concept is good, but you know, it, had, it has to be also the subject of a certain regulation by itself. I'll give you the classic example uh, of uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies being more interested in research about Viagra or uh, research about obesity or about statins than they will be about malaria. So how are we going to make sure that we put in place the mechanisms that are going to protect the global goods and the global interests? We have to have cooperation. I hope you're going to answer that question. How that will cooperation, we? <laughs> that cooperation cannot be left just for the markets and the competition to decide. Mm. You know, there is a need for a certain type of arbitration, yeah. and that arbitration has to be done with legitimacy, and that legitimacy is multilateralism. Right. I just want to, just a couple of really short questions. Please don't make a speech. <laughs> Thank you.
Give him the mic. We're really talking about end of global cooperation or a redefinition of global cooperation. Uh, I think we've come a long way, certainly, uh, uh, whether it's in globalization or in multilateralism, you know, but the challenges that I imagine uh, really seems to be forcing a redefinition of global cooperation and rather than uh, an end to it. So it's a bit like how big is this rethink? Exactly. How big is the rethink? Anybody just quickly, how big is the rethink? Look, throughout the history of, let's say, the last 70 years, there have been moments when certain nations engage and then withdraw. I think when, you know, powerful nations are at that moment, it obviously has ripple effects. But I would say to you, we are far from the end of global cooperation. Yes. In some countries, there are administrations, and we have just heard if the budget of the new U.S. administration does indeed include the kinds of cuts to multilateralism, it will harm, it will hurt the United Nations, it will hurt millions of people. But ultimately, it will not stop the end of cooperation, and certainly not global cooperation. And I think the United States will come back to the table, to the table because there is no better deal than putting a million on the desk and leveraging the resources of another 193 countries to solve a problem. And this is what we often forget. For some of the problems that we're trying to deal with, there is no better economic rationale than to put one dollar of taxpayers' money and have many other nations add their money and suddenly be able to solve this problem. And please let me just give you a reminder. At this era of the end of global cooperation, we've seen an unprecedented agreement of what development should be and how all nations will come together under the Agenda 2030. We have seen the Paris Agreement. We saw last year the Kigali Agreement, the Montreal Protocol, the most successful example of nations coming together to repair the ozone layer, actually reached an agreement in 2016, bringing technology, finance, and political consensus together. And I could go on. So yes, we will have shocks. We will have individual countries having different domestic political agendas. But the age, I think, is gone where, you know, one or two superpowers define the future of cooperation and the future of multilateralism. So I... A blip in the path to cooperation. <laughs> so I would expect that certainly certain, certain multilateral institutions such as the United Nations would continue to exist, but I think that they would exist in a much smaller scale and perhaps closer to their original mission uh, than, than they have uh, in, in the last uh, three or four decades. And I would view that as a very positive development because, again, it would promote this kind of country-by-country -country competition, allowing us to move the needle on many of the issues that need to be moved. I think where we live in a world where um, the elite and top-down governments, international organizations, official spokespeople are no longer trusted, and that's true worldwide. I think that's a real challenge for international organizations that they have to be even more agile than any other organizations in government or in our economies have to be because they can know the UNFCC, you know, the, the IPCC and the, the knowledge creation of the United Nations, they can no longer rely on a press statement that says the UN says this, therefore it's true. Because we know that three quarters of people don't believe official statements anymore. There's only one quarter of people that do. Is that an official survey? <laughs> that's, that's the Edelman Trust Barometer results worldwide. And what that means is that those international organizations that have knowledge that they want to put out can no longer do it by press release top down. They've got to learn to use social networks, peer groups, influences. That's a real challenge for them. That's a good thing. I, I think in a world where almost everybody has a cell phone, you cannot expect that the circulation of information, mm -hmm. the knowledge sharing, and interconnectedness is going to produce the same results as when we created the United Nations in 1945. So from a methodological point of view, processes have to change, approaches have to change. The way the UN and any multilateral institution does business has to change. And of course, the competition is already there because you have international NGOs, you have networks of activists, you have all kinds of actors that were not there before. You may talk about uh, urbanization and climate change. You'll have C40, which is a group of cities that come together and try to address the issues. So you have lots of competition already. But that does not deviate from the need for global cooperation to be even deeper and for that global cooperation that is going to be certainly deeper to be done in a very different Sounds way. Sounds like it might change in nature rather than reduce. Uh, just, just one comment or question very quickly, and then we must end. 
absent from this entire conversation, Nicholas Brazilian, absent from this entire con conversation about institutions, there's been any mention of the deinstitutionalized, the sin papeles, the, the migrants, the refugees, yes. this noise in the international signal. And I would be interested to hear what the panel thought about what this will do to their expectations. And this is reason. part of where we started, so it helps us in a way uh, end the conversation. This is part of what brought this change. Cooperation with the Yes. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so, so many people are just not really being taken care of. I mean, I think that the, 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 the um, migration crisis that we saw within Europe was, a very, was seen by many people as a very large failure, the, failure of is, Europe. This is the irony of the debate about the failure of multilateralism. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, three years ago were pleading with European and international donor nations that around Syria there were millions of people who they could no longer feed. They had to close the schools. There were no rations that they could deliver. And the health stations and posts had to be closed. This is the failure of listening to a multilateral system that was saying mm -hmm. to the world, this is a crisis building up. Help us, because what do people do if they cannot feed themselves, cannot give their children any education, have no health support? They have nothing to lose. And that's this tragedy of what we have seen over the last few years of absolutely desperate masses of people having to move because we didn't help them where they were. Yeah. And if I may just say, because this is so often misunderstood, the UN Secretary General's budget, the UN Secretariat, is around $5.8 billion. That's about 10% of the proposed increase in defense spending, not defense spending, proposed increase of defense spending of the new US administration. Just to put it into proportion, but twice as much as the citizens of New York are willing to pay two and a half times for the very proud fire department of New York. Now think about that for a moment. The city of New York with its people is willing to invest $1.9 billion every year into having a fire department that protects it and with great pride admire what they do. Seven billion people, 193 nations, are willing to invest just $5.8 billion to enable a secretary general with his specialized agencies and his staff to deal with everything from pandemics to climate change to refugees to wars to peacekeeping. Realism is needed and people in the public also need to understand and I fully agree with you, people are losing confidence. But they're partly losing confidence because the facts in the way they're presented to them are so out of um, proportion with reality that your only conclusion is, oh, we must be spending an inordinate amount on, on this thing called global cooperation and it's not delivering instant results. So there really is a challenge because of this, what we call a democratization of information, meaning that everybody has access to information but is not necessarily great at interpreting it, and also uh, the governments maybe are not listening to an institution like the UN. Thoughts? So I, I would argue <laughs> that, that it's, in, in fact, with, with the access to information, people are getting a better say in where it is their, you know, their, their resources should be deployed. And so, you know, in, in the, on the question of the migrant crisis, I think, you know, one, one uh, country that did shockingly little, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Syria, was Saudi Arabia. Yes. And Saudi Arabia was just next door. And so, you know, why, why is it that so much of the burden fell on Europe when the international community could not have persuaded Saudi Arabia to take, to, to face, right? So there is sort of a one-sidedness in this. And when we say that people uh, in, in these countries are responding badly to, uh, you know, the elites, it's because the elites have not been fair in the way uh, the, the, the burden of these international crises should be distributed across uh, all countries that are in, in a position to support it. So I think we're coming to a natural end, are we not? Yep, and so on, on the refugees, I would simply say, um, Germany offers a case of the better your government, the better trained, active, I have to say this, I'm the dean of a school of government, the better we can train, educate, and put people in the world that can really do public service well, the more likely you can succeed. Germany's taken more than a million refugees or asylum seekers in the last couple of years, it has now managed legally to process the asylum applications of all but the last 450,000. That's extraordinary. Just think about what that means. Um, I think we do have to also celebrate the ways that 
really great, well-trained individuals in government can actually make a huge difference, even on those big, tricky issues. So it's been um, quite an extraordinary, well, nearly hour and a half now that we've been talking. I think it's very clear um, that, that perhaps there needs to be a flexibility, a moulding of institutions, but also perhaps a moulding of people's understanding of what it is that's happening in the world. Thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed having you here. Great questions, and thank you to our panellists. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, it's a terrific chair.